So good morning. My name is Yannick Lefebvre. I'm a WordPress plugin developer. Uh, and my talk this morning, simply entitled WordPress Plugin Development 201, will be all about how do you create plugins. Now, those of you who attended my talk last year, last year I covered a lot of the basics of plugin development. This year I'll go into some more slightly advanced topics, things beyond the basics of how do you create a plugin. Uh, if you want to find me, I'm on you know, the Twitter, my website, my profile page on the WordPress website, uh, as well as where you can find this presentation. For those of you who might want to actually read it as we're going, it's on my website, and it's also available on the um, WordCamp Montreal page. You'll see a link to go to these slides. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, a few different topics. First, I'll just introduce myself quickly. Then I'll do a quick recap of the basics of what plugins are. Most people I hear expect know, these, uh, know, know this information, but just to set the stage. Then we'll talk about a few different things. First of all, I want to talk about how do you set up a local development environment. So if you're going to make plugins, it makes sense that you can do all of your work on these plugins on your own local machine. Then I'm going to talk about creating help tabs. So how do you create nice, user-friendly documentation for your users so that they can easily see how to use your plugin very easily within the confines of your plugin. I'm going to talk about jQuery. So jQuery can be both your friend and your enemy. How do you safely load it within your pages, and what kind of things can you do with it? I'll touch upon internationalization. That's often a very important topic, especially here uh, in Quebec. So how do you create plugins that will be available in multiple languages? And finally, I'll talk about enhancements you can do to your plugin page if you post it on WordPress.org. So how can you make it nice and fancy, like all the new pages that have been coming up over the last six months? So a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been using WordPress since the very early days, so since 2004. I released my very first plugin in 2005. And to this day, I have eight plugins that are available up on the repository. So you have their names over here. Like I said, all of them are up on the official repository. My most used one is Link Library, but there's many others out there that can help users uh, on their websites. Uh, I am also an author. So I recently published a book all about plugin development. So if you like some of the things, <laughs> if you like some of the things that we're going to be talking about today, uh, I encourage you to get this book. And so it's going to be, it's good, some of the topics I covered last year, some of the things I'll be covering today, and a lot more. Uh, to make it even more interesting this morning, I'm actually going to run a little contest. Uh, if you send a tweet to me, so at Y Lefebvre, with the hashtag WP Plugin Cookbook, I'll have three copies to give away by the end of this presentation. So those of you who are connected, um, then uh, there's also a quick link to be able to send that hashtag easily. And everybody else, there's also a special discount code that you can use to be able to pick up a copy straight from the publisher. So with the WC Montreal 12, and that's also on the slide deck you can get from the WordCamp Montreal website. You'll be able to click through this link and get a copy. So enough of the marketing pitch um, and moving into the subject. So a quick recap, first of all, of plugins. So plugins allow developers to be able to extend WordPress beyond its basic capabilities. Now, for those of you who are more familiar with WordPress.com, plugins are not really available there. There are some that are prepackaged for you on .com, but really, plugins are more in the realm of when you have your own hosted version of WordPress, you can install these plugins to be able to extend the capabilities of the platform. Uh, these plugins have been able to be created ever since the very first versions of WordPress. So WordPress has a very open architecture that lets you insert your own code throughout its, uh, its processing, and that lets you really extend the capabilities beyond what it does out of the box. Uh, the plugin API constantly evolves. So every time a new version runs, rolls around, there's always new features that are more back-end features for plugin developers that always make it easier to be able to go in there and really extend what the platform is going to be doing. Uh, the size of a plugin can really vary in complexity. A plugin could really be only a few, couple of lines that do a very specific things to files that are going to have thousands and thousands of lines of code. Some of the nice things about plugins is, well, first of all, the functionality stays in place even when the, when the theme changes. And that's something very important. If you're developing websites and you find yourself often going into a theme's functions.php uh, file and going in there and adding 
pieces of code, well, that code is specific to the theme. You should think if you're doing a lot of that work, adding a lot of code in that functions file, well, maybe there's a way it could just wrap that into a plugin. Then you don't have to worry when you go from theme to theme about moving that code over from one functions file into another. Uh, plugins can be installed directly from the WordPress admin or by downloading them and activating them. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this mechanism. Now, what makes up a plugin? Well, a plugin is made up of one or more PHP code files. These are going to contain, uh, they can also contain images, text files, translation files. So there can be a lot of things that are going to be next to that core PHP code file that represents the core plugin code. They're located under WP Content Plugins, so that's where all the plugins are going to be installed in your site. And the basic entry point for any plugin is going to be a PHP file that's going to have a specific uh, t piece of text at the top of its code. Last recap slide. Um, the power of plugins really comes from their ability to be able to register functions or callbacks that are going to be called at key points when WordPress is preparing pages to be displayed on screen. Now, these points could be uh, when the header gets rendered, when any admin page gets rendered, or they could also be when specific data is being prepared for display. So in general, there's two types of basic hooks that exist in WordPress that lets you register your callbacks. These are called action hooks or filter hooks. The action hooks will be when you can do what you want at a specific point in time. So this lets you inject extra output onto the page or be able to change how things are going to be uh, displayed on screen, whereas a filter hook is where you can go and manipulate some of the data that WordPress is going to be displaying. For more information on some of these recap topics, I do invite you to, to watch last year's presentation. I didn't want to redo it again, but it is captured on video, just as this year's presentations are going to be, and available on WordPress TV. So getting on to some of the new topics that I want to talk about, the first one was setting up a local development environment. So as you go and you write plugins, well, you need to test them. Now, testing your plugins on a live website can be a bit of a dangerous thing. So to avoid that, you want to look at running all of the tools that would be on a web server on your own machine. What this lets you, uh, what, this, what this gives you as benefits is, first of all, not having the risk of breaking a live installation. And here I refer to the white page of death. Anytime you go and work inside of your code, if you do something bad, your site could just throw a big white page that's going to have a PHP error, and that's it, no matter where you go on your website. Not necessarily something you want to have happen on a live site. So by working on your local computer, then you can avoid, make sure that if you break something, at least you're not affecting anybody else. There's also the, uh, the fact that if you're working locally on your own machine, you don't have to constantly go back and forth and re-upload files into a web server, make sure you're running the latest version. You're working on local files on your computer, so there's no, there's no time wasted in working with your FTP client. Page refreshes, well, you're working everything locally, so you don't need to go off to an outside web server, have it render the page, send it back to you. Uh, more control over web server configuration. So if you want to go inside of your server's PHP any files and go and play in there, it's right there on your local web server. You don't need to see, well, does my host even let me go and modify this file and modify how the server is going to work? Uh, a last point I didn't list on there is, well, you can work anywhere whether or not you have an internet connection if you're working locally on your computer. So this lets you work on a plane and be able to work on your website and develop your, your plugins without needing to have an internet connection. So some of the tools that I, can, that I use to be able to do this kind of setup is, first of all, having a local web server on your machine. Now, the one I use is called XAMPP. So that's a package that you download uh, and that contains everything from your web server to your PHP server to uh, having your uh, MySQL database in there. So everything is going to be contained within this package. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, this specific one is available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Now, there are others. So there's MAMP, there's WAMP. There's plenty of these packages that are out there. But in general, looking for a package that will contain all of these basic components will just make it very easy to be able to download it, install it on your computer, and then have a basic web uh, website in place. Now, the next step, once you have that basic core, is to get WordPress. So obviously, WordPress.org would be the place to do that. Downloading the package, 
copying it to the proper folder in your local web server, and then you're up and running with your local WordPress installation. Now, the other tools that I'm going to talk about are tools that I found to be very useful as well when you're developing your own plugins. And the first one is having a subversion client or a, sub, uh, a subversion-based tool. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, why would you want that if you're developing locally? Using a subversion client is going to do a few things for you. The first thing is that it's going to help you easily track versions of your work as you go, uh, as you develop your own plugins. So what I mean by that is Subversion is a version control system. It will be able to keep track and of different versions of files throughout the development of your plugin. If you've ever made copies of folders with dates, so if you ever created, OK, this is my plugin April 1st. This is my plugin April 15th. This is my plugin. Well, basically, Turtis SVN or any other subversion client will manage all of that for you without having a ton of folders everywhere, and then you're not sure which one you're going in or manually managing all that, a subversion client is going to give you a proper architecture around keeping track of all these different versions of files, letting you also attach comments to these files. So instead of just going, well, OK, what did I do in the April 15th version? Well, you don't necessarily remember that. Well, every time you store files inside of a subversion repository, it's going to ask you to put in a nice comment that says, what does this version do? Or what did you add in terms of functionality in that specific version? Now, there's different clients. I did just mention Turtis SVN on the Windows platform. There's others on Mac. There's others on Linux. Subversion is really open uh, in that point, and there's a lot of clients that can let you access it. Uh, the other two types of tools that are very helpful when you're writing your own plugins are either a code text editor or an integrated development environment. So if you've ever opened up a plugin in Notepad, you'll see that a plugin can look very drab because you have a lot of text, you have a lot of stuff. And in Notepad, it's all going to look the exact same font, the exact same color, so it's not easy to read. When you move to a text editor that's going to offer some proper text coloring, well, it's already going to start to make a lot more sense. So you can see here, for example, in green, we have uh, everything that's comments. In black, we have functions that are uh, inside of the code. In purple, we have all of the different text strings. So already a lot more readable. Now, moving to a full IDE, like NetBeans, well, then you get extra capabilities. You get that coloring that you get from a text editor, but then you get other services. So you get the ability to do FTP. You get the ability to directly query your database. You get the ability to do your subversion check-ins right from the NetBeans interface. So it kind of really brings together all the tools that you might need in one place instead of having to go through all these different interfaces. Now, if you want to learn more about NetBeans, what I invite you to do is attend Jeremy's session this afternoon at 2 o'clock. He's going to do a whole session on the NetBeans IDE. So the next topic I wanted to cover was creating help tabs. So whenever you create a, a plugin, well, you might want to have your users be able to get information on how to use it properly. Now, creating plugins you might do for different reasons. You might do it for customer. So it might be a plugin that you create for one of your customers and you deliver only on their installation. Or it might be a plugin that you want to look at publishing on the official repository, so on the official WordPress.org website. Either way, you're going to have people that might not be too comfortable or might not know how to use your plugin. And so creating help tabs can let you build in documentation right into the plugin. So you should always look at having documentation. Now, by default, <clears throat> a plugin will let you do a readme file that comes with it. Now, of course, nobody really reads those. Uh, and it also lets you put in basic notes and FAQs on the WordPress.org site, which nobody tends to go to. I mean, I've written a lot of plugins, and often I have to go, well, you know, RTFM, go to the WordPress.org site, that's where it is under the FAQ. But that's, you know, it, it still takes time out of your schedule to have to point the user to go over to uh, the website. So using help tabs, you can build in your help right into WordPress, and so uh, right into your plugin, I'm sorry, in the admin interface. And so this has been improved recently in version 3.3 and, and on, so 3.3 and 3.4, where you can actually create multi-tab help inside of the interface. So whenever you're creating a plugin with an admin page, it's very easy to go in there and add your own extra help. So what that might look like is that little help tab that's on the far top right corner, 
users are already familiar with that help tab throughout the rest of the interface. And so then you can go in and build in your own section there that's going to have information. And when I'm talking about multiple tabs, what I'm talking about is, of course it's going to fall, uh, right here where you can create, for example, an instructions tab, an FAQ tab, and then the user can page through these different sections to be able to see all the information that you've packaged in with your plugin. Now, creating this is done through a set of very simple API functions that are provided uh, by WordPress. So if you've ever created a plugin and that had a, a configuration page, you've seen you've had to use the add options page function. That's a, a function that I covered in my talk last year. And so it lets you register with WordPress your own configuration page for your plugin. Now, the only difference from just defining your page is that when you want to create help tabs, you should look at storing the value that add options page is going to return inside of a variable. Once you have that variable, well, if it exists, what you do is you register a callback that's going to be called only when that page gets loaded. Now, if you're familiar with add action, so this is the WordPress function that lets you register your own function call with any hooks. A lot of these hooks have specific names. So for example, WP head, that's a specific hook that has a specific name. However, what we're seeing here is you have also something of interest. This is a hook name that has a variable name, load dash, and then we have the name of the page. This way, that callback function will only be called when it's your plugins admin page that's gonna be displayed. So you don't have to worry about this popping up all over the place. It's very specific to the work you're doing. Then the code itself, so there's a lot of code on this page, but you'll see that it's quite simple. First thing we do in our function is get the current screen. So then we'll get a screen object, which is an object in WordPress that contains a lot of utility functions around managing the display of your page for your plugin. Then we'll say, well, add a help tab. We'll give it an ID, so that's an internal ID that's gonna be the name of this tab. You'll see it in the HTML output as a div name inside of there. We'll give it a title, so this is the string that we saw on the name of the tab that the user could click on. And we'll see that we have a callback, and so this is the function that you're going to be uh, writing afterwards to be able to populate the content of that help tab. We're gonna do the same to add our second tab, and we also created a little sidebar, and so here we have a little bit of HTML that's gonna be output on the right-hand sidebar. So a very simple code, a few function calls, a few arrays, and then we've registered two callbacks and we've populated a sidebar. In terms of the, uh, the actual two tabs themselves, these functions are just gonna output straight HTML. So it's very easy for you to, to format this the way you want, to include images, text, style, things you want, but to include a lot of information that's gonna be available to your users. And just to show again the final result, so, these names came from the arrays that were originally set up, and this is straight HTML. Now everything else, the animation, that when you click on it, it slides out to have the different tabs, all these things are going to automatically be handled by WordPress as part of its basic architecture. So you only need to focus on how many tabs do you want and what you're gonna put in them. Next thing I wanna talk about is jQuery. Now, some of the things I'm gonna talk about here apply to plugin developers and to theme developers. jQuery is great. JavaScript, jQuery, all these things. Now it can bring a lot of interactivity to a site. It can also break a site very quickly. Now WordPress does include some mechanisms to help avoid these conflicts. So what do I mean? Well, if you're a WordPress developer or a, theme, a plugin developer, a theme developer, and somewhere in your code you're loading jQuery from google.com, yes, it'll load really fast, but if anybody else is loading his own version of jQuery, so any plugin installed, anything else installed is trying to load its own version of jQuery, you've just broken up a site. So there's techniques to use when you're writing your plugins or your themes to be able to look at loading jQuery. The first thing is that there are three different action hooks where you can look at making a call to load up jQuery. Now this is a bit different than before. This happened in version 3.3. Before it was a bit arbitrary where you could put these calls to load your own scripts, but now they've broken it down very cleanly into three action hooks that you can register. 
One is you can register a function that will be called when front-facing pages are being generated. And so then in that callback, we'll be able to load the jQuery, and I'll say how to do that in a second. The other one is when you're rendering in min pages. So if you're building up your plugins and min page and you want some specific jQuery scripts to be loaded up there or any kind of JavaScript, you should do it registered with this hook. And the last one is if you want things that are loaded only on the login page. So there you can have specific scripts that are going to be loaded. Now when you get a callback from any of these action hooks, the function that you call is WPNQ script jQuery. Very simple, but instead of having an HTTP reference and loading it from Google, what this does is that it makes sure that everybody who wants jQuery is going to call this function, and then WordPress is going to make sure that there's only one that gets loaded in the end inside of the page header. Then you avoid conflicts. Then you don't get a user who says, I love, you. I love the idea of your plugin. I can't get it to work because some theme developer thought it was a good idea to load up jQuery by himself with his own copy or by referring to an external site. Now, there's a lot of other scripts that you can load this way. So for example, Scriptaculous, Thickbox, TinyMC, there's a lot of these different JavaScripts that are packaged in with WordPress, and you can allow load them up by using this function and then just changing the name of the library here that you want to load up. If you want to load your own script, so if you found a nice JavaScript or jQuery library somewhere else, you can use the same function, WPNQ script, just has a whole bunch more parameters to say where is your script, what version is it, those types of things. But you use the same mechanism. This way, if another plugin developer is using the same version of some third-party script, again, it will just make sure that only one of them will actually get loaded and displayed uh, inside of your page header, again, avoiding uh, conflicts between these different elements. Now, to show you some of the interesting things you can do with jQuery, well, I just wanted to show more of a full example. Here we're going to just display a quick pop-up that's going to come up on the screen. People love to do pop-ups to be able to get the user to subscribe to a newsletter or do, uh, give them uh, a call to action on their website. So here, if we look at what this would look like, we would have add action, the WPNQ scripts action hook, the function we've declared. We load up jQuery. Here we'll load another function called add thick box. This is a WordPress function all around this thick box script. And then we're going to add code to the footer. Once that gets called, and I'll spare you all the details here, but we have basically a JavaScript function that will display a nice little pop-up after a few seconds. And what the user would see afterwards is a little pop-up message that would show up on the screen. So with very few lines inside of this plugin and safely loading our jQuery, we've been able to do a pop-up dialog on screen using some uh, simple plugin code. Next topic I'm going to be covering is internationalization. So what that is is the ability to make your plugins translatable. So WordPress, as you may know, can be translated. So by default, WordPress is in English, but you can go in and download packages, language packs that will translate it to French, to German, to Russian, whatever the case may be. That's all built in into the platform. Now, these same mechanisms can be used to be able to translate plugins so that you can go in and provide translations in different languages so that your plugin will be displayed in the native language when a user has chosen to use WordPress in a language any uh, other than English. <clears throat> now, this translation work can be done by anyone. There's a bit of initial setup work that needs to be done by the plugin developer to go into his code and make sure that every time something gets displayed on screen, he puts the proper code in there, but then afterwards, any user could go in and create a local translation of a plugin. I've received a few uh, translations from some of my users for plugins in Italian and uh, Turkish and a few other languages. It's always interesting to see when people are using your creations around the world. And then, you know, they're, they're, they're nice about it. They'll set it to me, I can roll into the plugin, and then afterwards they can get it with the official distribution as new versions come out and, ha and have it in their own language. Now, the key functions that are to be used when you want to do translation are the underscore E function and the underscore underscore function. Now, that second one might sound a bit funny, but it is really just two underscores that you use. The difference between these two is very simple. Underscore E 
will try to find a translation string for the text that you want to display, and it's going to then echo it directly to your browser. The underscore underscore function instead is going to do a lookup, try to find uh, the translation string, and then it's going to return it. So then afterwards you can store in a variable or do some other manipulations with that string before you display it on screen. So what that would look like inside of your code could be something like this. If you had uh, an H2, which I forgot to close, um, you could have an underscore E in here, then you'd have the string you want to display, and this is what's called the text domain. So the text domain is really the name of your translation dictionary. I'll explain a little bit more about what that is in a few seconds. And so if it doesn't find a translation, so if you wrote your plugin in English, somebody's in Russia, they install your plugin, there's no Russian translation, it's just gonna display count number. But if it does find the Russian counterpart for that string with your, within your plugin, then it would be able to display that on screen. And so if we look at a, a very simple admin page code, so I'll, what we have here is a function that could show basic admin uh, section, that could show a header one, that could draw a little form. So this is what it would look like before you internationalized it. And then what it would look like after would be that any text string that you had before, you would have wrapped inside of a little bit of PHP code, used the underscore E function, that's your initial string that you had, and then refer to your text domain. So it is a little bit of an extra effort, but in the end, it can really open up your plugin to be able to be translated to a lot of different languages. Now, once you've done that initial setup work within your plugin, the next thing that you want to do is you want to create these dictionaries for the different languages. Now, you can do it two ways. You can, if you only know one language, well, you can create a basic template that's only in English, and then people can use that and create and copy it and create the translations from that basic template. Or if you know multiple languages, well, you could provide a few different languages out of the box with your plugin. A nice tool to do that translation is called Poedit. So this tool will let you, through a very simple interface, show you all of the original strings, and then let you go and provide the strings inside of another language. So in this case, this is the French translation, and you can see here the FR code at the end of the file name. So that would let you provide the French translation for that plugin incorporated within all the files that, are, that make it up. The last little step towards translation is that you need to load up that translation dictionary so that it's available for WordPress to, to know to look up these translation strings. And so where you could do that is under the init hook, you could register your own function, and then afterwards in your function, you would call this load plugin domain, a uh, plugin text domain. That's the name of your domain, and this long thing here is going to basically uh, resolve to being your plugins directory under its languages folder. And it would go and look in there for a file that has the name of the language of the installation that the user is currently running. That was a long sentence. Uh, like I said, the fault text is shown if there is no translation. A few things to be wary about if you're going to be doing um, this kind of work, if you're going to be translating a plugin. While it might be tempting to, de to do pound declares or to create a variable to use, so every time you go underscore E and you have a string name, well, if you're going to display that string multiple times, and let me just go back here just to make sure that's clear. For example, here, if you're going to be displaying on screen new Google Analytics plotting again over and over again, some of you might think, well, I'll just do a pound define or I'll just create a variable. That doesn't play very well with the translation mechanisms in WordPress. So if you do that and you don't get your translations, you do need to really just spell out all those strings uh, inside of your code. Uh, the other thing is that now, you know, opinions differ a bit on that, but punctuation can be included within the text. So something like a comma, well, you know, you could do two text strings before and after the comma, but that makes it a bit more restrictive. If you just make the whole text string, including a comma, including a period, well then, depending on where the comma is going to fall based on the syntax of these other languages, then it's very easy for the person doing the translation to just put the comma where it goes, or even just to completely throw it out, because this way they can just make it right for these other languages. Uh, a few other more advanced functions that can be used when you're doing translation. 
uh, underscore n and underscore x. So underscore n is going to let you do translation, but looking at uh, the context of are you printing a word that refers to something singular or plural? So what it lets you do is basically look at the value of a variable and say, well, if there's only a value of one in that variable, I'll put the, the singular version of that word. And if, the, if there's multiple things, then I'll put the plural version. So that can be the difference between saying eight one item and eight items on your screen. So just little things to make it even more sharp, more professional in your output. The other one is translating with context. It may happen that within your plugin, you have the same word, you have multiple words that are spelt the same in English, but that have different meanings. So what you can do here is say, I want to translate, I don't have a good example. If toaster had multiple meanings, I want to translate toaster within this context, or I want to translate it within a different context, so that it knows which translation string to look up, and it puts the right thing on screen, so you don't end up with strange stuff. Uh, you do have other compound versions of these. So for example, EX with echo uh, underscore NX would be actually a compound of singular versus plural and the context. So a lot of these other combination functions exist within WordPress. Last but not least, I wanted to show you how you could enhance your plugin page on WordPress.org. So if you've ever gone through the, the, the work of creating a plugin, posting it up on WordPress.org, uh, you, you might have seen a page like this with your plugin information. So what this has is you know, basic information, the name of your plugin, a little description, a download button. Now you may have seen over the last eight months or so, there's been a lot of plugins that have started to have very nice images on their plugin page on the repository. Now that's something you can do yourself as a plugin developer, but you need to know exactly what are the steps to do it. And once you do it, then you can end up with a nice page like this. So in this case, we have the name again with a slightly different layout. And we have a very large image, which is something that's provided by the plugin developer. So the way you achieve this, well, there's a few rules to follow to be able to create it. The first one is that you must create a banner that is exactly 772 pixels by 250. Yes, it's an odd number, but that's the number they chose. So exactly that resolution. The banner must have a, also a very specific name. So banner 772 by 250, just to make sure you remember, .png. Once you have that image, now I think you can also play around and make it a bit bigger, but you're going to break the layout. So you don't necessarily want to do that. Once you have that, then what you need to do is you need to upload that image to your plugins repository. I talked a little bit about subversion early on. WordPress actually uses subversion for all of its plugin management. So when you have a plugin on the official repository, you have access to a subversion folder that's going to have three directories within it. They're called branches, tags, and trunk. Now, to be able to create this banner and upload it, you need to create a fourth folder called assets. Again, very specific name, assets spelt like th this exact way, and then you can upload your banner with its specific name inside of that folder. As soon as it's there, it's going to display on the page. Now one warning, and I'll just go back to highlight it, make sure you don't have anything fancy in this corner, because that's where your plugin name is going to go. So if you have something nice, it's going to be splash splattered with your own big plugin name over it. So kind of judge where that's going to fall based on your, the length of the name of your plugin, how big is that box going to be, and just make sure that all of your uh, important graphics are around there. Now this graphic could really be anything. I've seen some that are plain images like this one. Others have some really nicely laid out description of what the plugin does, screenshots of the plugin in action. It's really up to you to decide how you want to create that image, but it does give you a very good clear voice so that the user can right away know Will this be what I want or not? Uh, a few recommended readings. Of course, I had to mention the book again. Um, so, you know, it's a good collection of all of the little tidbits, all code samples that I've found over the years as I've been writing plugins all in one place. Uh, other great places to look at, well, the WordPress Codex. It, there's a lot of information in there to be able to learn about how the plugins work, 
how do all the hooking mechanism works. There's a lot of information in there. It's not always fully complete because it is volunteer maintained, but there is a lot of good data in there. Uh, PHP.net, there's always that one function that, you, uh, that you're not exactly sure what the parameters are. Going on PHP.net could quickly get you by to be able to figure out what that function name is or what are the arguments that function. Uh, stackoverflow.com, a uh, great website that has a lot of code snippets on how to build things. I've spent a lot of time on that site. When I, I knew I wanted to do something, there had to be a way to do it, searching through Stack Overflow until I found the right example to be able to get me by. Uh, this presentation is available on my website, so it's a bit of a long URL. It's also, you can click through to the presentation on the WordCamp Montreal site. So that's very easy.